We're practicing Christmas today. The crowd went wild. It's Christmas in June. We're in the book of Luke. And as I promised last week, it's Christmas in June. Because we've come to Luke chapter 2, which is talking about the birth of Jesus Christ. So as we go, remember last week, we talked about John the Baptist, and we looked in Luke chapter 1 about the special birth of John the Baptist, who would be the forerunner of Jesus Christ. All of the prophecies that were made about him, Isaiah chapter 40, says, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. And every valley shall be exalted, and every mountain and hill brought low. The crooked places shall be made straight, and the rough places made smooth. So we talked about John the Baptist coming and what his message was. Before he was ever born, he had the Spirit of God while he was in his mother's womb, which is an interesting thing. God had his call on his life to do a particular mission. When Jesus was asked about John the Baptist, he says, But what did you go out to see, a man clothed in soft garments? Indeed, those who wear soft clothing are in king's houses. But what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I say to you, and more than a prophet. For this is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way before you. Surely I say to you, among those born of women, there is not risen one greater than John the Baptist, but he who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence, and the violent take it by force. For all the prophets in the law prophesied until John. And if you are willing to receive it, he is the Elijah who is to come. A prophecy about one who would come before the Lord Jesus Christ and prepare his way. And we got to see his birth with his mother, Elizabeth, and Zechariah, his father. In verse 1 of chapter 2, you guys know this story. It's very familiar. You probably hear it every Christmas and of course, it's one of those things where you can tend to tune out if you've already heard it before, like uh, listening to commercials during the Super Bowl. You know, you want to get back to the game, you know, so you want to, you just kind of phase it out, unless you're looking for all the really cool commercials that cost millions of dollars. This is one of them. And it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. The census took place while Quirinius was governing Syria. So all went to be registered, everyone to his own city. Leave it to government to mess up everyone's life. <laughs> Caesar Augustus, that wasn't his real name. Actually, you see his name here is Gaius Octavius. But he wanted a more godlike name, and so he chose Augustus, which means like the gods or Caesar God. You can call me Caesar God. That's kind of nice to give yourself that name. And he says, what I want everybody to do is I want you all to make a home run so we can count you, so we can tax you. That sounds just like government, doesn't it? And yet, who's pulling the strings behind this? It's God himself. Because there are prophecies written that Jesus the Christ, he would be born in Bethlehem the city of David. So how do you get a virgin who is engaged to be married, who is found to be pregnant by the Holy Spirit, somewhere between 14 and 16 years old, to Bethlehem? Well, you link her up with a guy she's not quite married to, and you pull the strings on the government, because that'll make things happen, and it's a good thing that they were obedient, right? Can you imagine if he just said, you know, Joseph said, forget it. I'm not doing that. I don't care what they say, Caesar, I don't listen to Caesar. If he had a rebellious spirit about listening to the authorities that were put over him. And yet God used that to get them exactly where they needed to be. Now, our taxes don't look like they're going to be any better. Just in case you didn't know. I noticed something interesting about Caesar. Does he look like somebody you know? Doesn't he look like Putin? I mean, he's got that, that same kind of thing on the face. Anyway, I'm sorry. I'll move on. Joseph 
also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, which means city of bread. Because there was, because of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed wife, who was with child. Now, I don't know about you, but if I was traveling with a 14 to 16 year old who was not my wife and she was pregnant and I was going home to my hometown, I wonder how I'd be received. Well, we know how they were received because there was nowhere for them in the city of Bethlehem, which is his hometown. Wasn't exactly a girl you'd want to bring home to mom and dad in the sense that she's pregnant unexplainedly except by the Holy Spirit. And so they're going to go off to Bethlehem to do their deed. By the way, it's about an 80-mile trek, and they may have had her on a donkey in her third trimester going out and taking an 80-mile journey on foot or on the back of a donkey. I don't know if any of you have ever walked that far, but driving that far seems wearisome to me. And I can't imagine being in my third trimester pregnant or being the betrothed husband of a woman who is and having to do this. And yet she obediently goes and he obediently goes to the city of his house, 80 miles away. And so it was that while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered. Some people might say, of course, of course. Got the, got the government pulling the strings. Now I'm out here, nine months pregnant, and of course, now the baby comes. Some of you might complain that way. Well, maybe not you people. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes or, or torn cloths, much like they wrap a dead body, and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. A manger is a stone feeding trough. It's not the, the typical thing that you're used to thinking of. It's a stone feeding trough. And it tends to develop funk, bacteria, from the slime and the drool and everything else that gets inside of this. And this is not where you would lay a newborn baby, right? But there was no room for them. You know, we're used to seeing something like that. By the way, this is a $1,200 crash right there. Uh, you can get it on Amazon. Here, let me give you the number. <laughs> that didn't happen. You know, you usually have this set up. It's a, it's a nice little shack with a thatched roof, and you make it pretty, and, you know, you put lots of hay in there, and you got all the animals there. By the way, you know the Scripture doesn't say anything about animals being there. That's interesting. But anyway, so you've got, you got all the animals there. you got the... The wise men as well, who don't show up for another, you know, two and a half years or a year and a half or so. So you got everybody there at the, you know, the whole scene, you know, but they don't have Anna. They don't have, you know, they don't have a whole bunch of people that should be there, but they have a bunch of people that shouldn't be there. So I don't know. Maybe you just want to get a stone trough, but that's not pretty. In Micah 5.2, it says, But you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, though you are little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be ruler in Israel, whose goings are from old, from everlasting. He's talking about the Messiah to come, that the Messiah would come to Bethlehem. By the way, there are about 400 prophecies about Jesus Christ. I don't know if you know who Gene Dixon is. <laughs> There's, she, makes, she makes predictions every year of what's going to happen. And, you know, there was one year when that one thing she said ever occurred. And yet she has the respect of the entire world. And yet the Bible has 400 prophecies about Jesus. And many of them, you're going to see just in this little story, came true. I, I think it's an amazing thing. And yet people disregard the Bible. Now there were in that same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, 
and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. Well, that would do it for me. Out in a field in the middle of the night, watching your sheep, and if you know anything about shepherds, they're outcasts. These, they, would, they said that if people that, who were shepherds came into town, you locked your doors because ten, th- things tend to disappear. They had to cleanse themselves for a week straight just to be able to go into the temple because they were considered that dirty and that foul and people didn't associate with them. And they were out and they were separated from human beings so they could be as antisocial as they wanted to be. So here are the shepherds and there are angels that are going to come to the shepherds and give them news. A most unlikely group of people to give the birth of Jesus, the Christ, the Son of God to. And yet, that's exactly what God did. I think about lots of people who were shepherds. You've got Abel, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Rachel, Moses, David, Job, and Amos. All of these, and with so others as well, were shepherds. So they watched sheep. So it's, it's something that it's not rare for people to do. But they're out in this place. It's about an, a mile west of Bethlehem where they have all their sheep and they're walking them. It says in Micah 4.8, a prediction, by the way, and you, O tower of the flock, by the way, that is the Migdal Adar, which is the place that they were. So this is a prophecy about that place and those people. O tower of the flock, the stronghold of the daughter of Zion, you sh- to you it shall come, even the former dominion shall come, the kingdom of the daughter of Israel. There's this prediction that something's going to happen over in this sheep area. And guess what? This is where the angel decides to show up. And the same book that tells us about Micah and about Bethlehem tells us also about this shepherd area. Verse 10, And the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, because they were afraid. And for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be for all the people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign to you. This will be the sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. That's some very interesting news to receive in the middle of the night, don't you think? This is going to be the sign to you. It's an interesting thing because this is prophesied that there would be a sign given and it would be a virgin who gives birth. And so this is what you're, you're thinking is going to be found and that you'll find a baby lying in a feeding trough, which you don't usually find babies laying in a feeding trough, right? If you said, listen, you're going to go buy a house, you'll hear a child crying and he'll be lying in a bassinet with his parents over him. You'd say, well, that's not unusual. That's going to be a little tough to find because there's a whole bunch of those. But find one in a feeding trough along the side of the road probably where all this occurred. So he's sending them on this wonderful hide-and-seek adventure, right? He's saying, by the way, there's a Messiah that's, that's born in Bethlehem tonight. I always hear Linus in the back of my head reading this. Do you, do you hear I know what Christmas is about, Charlie Brown. And then he reads the passage. But you don't normally find babies sitting where food is. Not usually. And so, but that's the ridiculous statement. That's what he's saying. You're going to find a baby sitting in a feeding trough. And I can imagine, you know, you know how when people, they listen, they don't listen to exactly what you say. They kind of get an impression or a feeling. And then they walk away with that and think that that's what you said. Like if my wife said, listen, you're going to wear that shirt this morning? She hates me. She hates me in the show. I'm getting fat. That's what she's saying. I'm getting fat. No, that's not what she said. She's just wondering because she wants to match me. You see, but I don't know that. But see, I wonder if the shepherds walked away and said, what? What did he say? You're going you're gonna to go to a, be, he's going to be sitting where? In a, you know. I can imagine the conversation, and of course, they're all correcting each other exactly what was said. And, you know, somebody who was smart enough to write it on their hand in a Sharpie is saying, yeah, this is what he said. 
And so this is the sign that you will see. It says in Isaiah 7, 14, therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and you shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. I think it's amazing that God spoke to the shepherds. Now, this is the, the house of David, right? And David was a, a shepherd. He was a shepherd before he became a king. And I think it's amazing that he would go to the shepherds, the shepherds who are, who are with all of these sheep who ultimately will be sacrifices in Jerusalem because the Lamb of God has come. And the announcement of the Lamb of God went to the shepherds. Peter says in Acts 10, when speaking to the Gentiles and they coming into the fold and putting faith in Christ, and Peter opened his mouth and said, in truth, I perceive that God shows no partiality. You see, God didn't go to the king. He didn't go to the influential, the wealthy. He didn't go to, you know, he didn't go to LA and announce his arrival. He didn't, you know, call the newspapers. And he went to shepherds. Jesus came in the lowest fashion he could to a young girl who was pregnant before being married to a man named Joseph who was mostly scratching his head wondering, what the heck am I going to do here? If you've ever been embarrassed, Jesus knows. If you've ever felt out of place in an outcast, Jesus knows. There's nothing that you can go through that Jesus doesn't know. And that's why he came the way he did. And suddenly there was an, with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace, goodwill towards men or peace to men with goodwill, depending on how you want to read it. Well, I, I put that warning up there, subject to spontaneous outbursts of song and dance, because all throughout the, the book of Luke, we've seen that the Lord speaks to people and then they suddenly get excited and they, they burst forth and they have this little song. And of course, the angels have one as well. And you can imagine Luke taking all this information down very, very carefully. Who do you think he got this from? Mary, probably Mary. When he went to the shepherds, he probably got it from the shepherds. But he's getting all of this information, and you won't find it in the other Gospels, which is an amazing thing. So if it wasn't for Luke doing his reporter thing, we wouldn't have all this wonderful information. And so can you imagine, it says myriads, which means 10,000s of angels came. Like the entire sky must have lit up. I wonder if it woke everybody up, you know, with the, the brightness. And then they all began to sing. So one angel comes, and then suddenly the curtains of heaven were drawn back, and there's 10,000s of angels in the sky saying this. If you thought they were scared before, because one angel shows up, imagine what happened when they saw 10,000s of them in the sky. And so it was when the angels had gone away from them into heaven that the shepherds said to one another, let us now go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has come to pass, which the Lord has made known to us. That's what I would do. By the way, this is an actual picture from the area where they were shepherding sheep. This is what the sunrise looks like. This is the kind of terrain. And I just imagine 10,000s of those angels up in the sky. And this is a mile from Bethlehem. So it's an interesting thing. What did they do with all their flocks? If they're going to go into town, you, you, don't, you don't bring a multitude of sheep with you. I wonder if Jesus was thinking about this when he said that parable of a man who lost the one sheep and he had 99. And he went to look for the one and he left the 99 in the wilderness. Do you remember that parable? It sounds exactly like this, where the shepherds leave their sheep and they go to look for the one, the Lamb of God. And so they go, and you know they've got to be pumped up. They've got to be amped up. They've got to be excited about the birth of Jesus. And so they go. And I can, you know, you can hear them probably in the street if you were there. And they're saying, Jesus is born. But to you and I, that means something. But to them, Jesus was as common as, you know, Tom. So <laughs> Tom is born. Or John is born. You know, it's a common name. 
And they'd be like, you know, oh, the shepherds are drunk, you know, on the street. But they're excited because they just heard from the angel about Jesus coming. And they're telling everybody, probably telling all their shepherd friends and everybody. You know, when the Lord comes to you and sends you something and tells you something, you want to tell the world, don't you? And the people will just think you're out of your mind. In the second chapter of Acts, they all began to speak in tongues and they all heard the wonders of God being spoken in their own language. And they said, ah, these guys are drunk. But when the Lord speaks to you, the stuff that's going on inside of you, you want to be on the outside of you and you want to share that with other people. Have you been excited about the Lord lately? You know, the world has just gone crazy. We're the new shepherds, boys and girls. We're the ones who will go and tell the world about Jesus. In verse 16, and they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. And now when they had seen him, they made widely known the saying which was told them concerning this child. And all those who heard it marveled at those things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. Then the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had seen and was told to them. So they find Jesus and they visit him. You know, these are the first evangelists in the scriptures. These are the first ones that go out and tell about Jesus. And they do it with great excitement. Now, their testimony might not have been received because they weren't, you know, the upper crust of society. And yet, God will move. If you tell people about Jesus, God's word is the thing that brings faith. It's his spirit that brings conviction. So all you are is a messenger. Just deliver the message. That's all you have to do is speak the truth and do it in love, I would hope. You don't want to do it, you know, with, with a big baseball bat, try to convince somebody to repent so they don't go to hell. It's a little like trying to force somebody to take a million dollars. That seems silly. So Mary ponders all these things in her heart, and so this is kind of brewing inside of her, and she's remembering the angel that came to her and the dream that her husband had and all of that. And now these shepherds are given news, and they show up unannounced. I mean, I don't, I don't know if anybody comes to your house unannounced. You ever have that happen? You know, and you open the door, and there's somebody you know, and you're like, oh, hi. What do you want? What are you doing here? What, what's going on? Something wrong? No, I just thought I'd drop by and say hi. You mind if I come in? You know, you should have called me. I would have cleaned the house. You know, or I would have put on some decent clothes, you know. And so shepherds show up just after a birth. I mean, I guess women throughout the centuries have gotten used to people just walking in on them in the, in the most vulnerable positions, you know, in stirrups or whatever, and, you know, complete strangers walking in and have a conversation about your pregnancy or whether your water broke or whether you're crowning or how many centimeters you are. And total strangers walk in a room and you're like, hey, hi, how are you? Yeah, you're, you're, as long as you have a white coat on, you're good. And here these shepherds come in just after the birth of Jesus. I, I, just the indignity of that. And yet Mary doesn't think that it's an intrusion. She ponders these things and she kind of lets them kind of simmer in her heart and she remembers them. What a great attitude that is. You know, there are things that happen in our lives that if we don't absorb them and kind of think about them, they'll pass us by and we'll forget about them. And we won't even be able to remember them. You know what I mean? like the year we had COVID. <laughs> and then eight days were completed for the circumcision of the child and his name was called Jesus. The name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. Poor Joseph doesn't even get to name his own kid. But I guess it's okay because it's Jesus. His name means Jehovah is salvation. Jehovah is salvation. That's his name. That's the name. That's the, the, the Greekized version, version of Yeshua, which is Jesus. What a blessing that is. And so after eight days, you're to bring the child in, and 
the child is to be circumcised, which is they identify with the family of God, with the, the people of Israel, and it's a ceremony. It's a wonderful ceremony. Ladies, you're not missing anything. <laughs> I mean, you can imagine, hold still, don't move. I was there for my son, and it was not as enjoyable as I thought it would be. But after eight days, they're to go and have the child circumcised. And then there's another period of time afterwards where Mary is to keep herself away from the temple and from other people until she's fully healed. And it's interesting in Deuteronomy in the Old Testament, if you have a boy, you got to wait 33 days until you're uh, ceremonially clean. If you have a, a girl, it's 66 days. I don't know why. Because the girls seem to take much less maintenance once they're born. Now, when the days of her purification, according to the law of Moses, were completed, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every male who opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice according to what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Now, I know you guys don't do this when you have children. You don't wait for a period of time and then go make a sacrifice. But in the Old Testament, if you remember Passover, when the Lord passed over and the firstborn of all of the Egyptians and the Israelites were saved, if they put blood on the doorpost and the lintel, the, this angel of death would pass over. And the firstborn males were preserved if you had the, the, the blood up. They become a prophecy of Jesus. They all point to this only begotten son of God being born, the very first son. And I think that's the whole point of it. Because why would God just arbitrarily say, well, let me see, what do I do for number 10? I've done so much. You know, we'll just, we'll wipe out the firstborn male of every family if they don't put blood on their post. Yeah, that, that's good. That's fairly arbitrary. They'll understand that. God didn't do it arbitrarily. It was all in preparation of the coming of Jesus Christ coming, the one and only begotten Son of God. And so two turtle doves. By the way, in Deuteronomy, it says that you're supposed to bring a lamb and you're supposed to buy back your child. Essentially, the lamb gets sacrificed instead of your son. It's a trade-off. The Lord says, the firstborn is mine, and if you want him back, you're going to have to pay for it. And so you bring this lamb and pay for it. What do you see in that? That's what God did for us. He sent his only son to purchase us. All of this in the Old Testament to speak of what God was ultimately going to do as a prophecy. And yet this provision a little further down in Leviticus in verse 8 says, And if she's not able to bring a lamb, then she shall bring two turtle doves or two young pigeons. One is a burnt offering and the other is a sin offering. So the priest shall make atonement for her and she will be clean. So if you couldn't afford a lamb, because not everybody could afford a lamb, you bring a couple of turtle doves, which tells me that Jesus was born to one of the poorest families that there ever was. They were good and poor. You know Mary's a good girl, right? She's doing all the right stuff. You know Joseph's doing the right stuff. He went 80 miles with this woman to, to be obedient to Caesar. These are good people, and yet they have nothing. They're poor. So if anybody tells you that you'll be healthy, wealthy, and wise if you, if you come to know Jesus Christ, they're trying to sell you something because Jesus was not born into a rich family. And if anyone was blessed, you would think it would be Joseph and Mary. If anybody showed good behavior, it certainly was Joseph and Mary. And yet, they were poor. And I just think that the Lord writes some of these things in there for when this occurs, that our ears would be perked up. In verse 25, and behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And this man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was upon him. You'll notice the Holy Spirit always mentioned throughout Luke's gospel, especially here in the beginning. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And so he came by the Spirit into the temple. You see, Simeon is not a priest. He's not anybody in the temple. He's just some dude. Actually, tradition tells us he was 113 years old. 
So this is a guy who's probably saying, don't you think it's time to send a Messiah? <laughs> kind of, I'm kind of old here. I can just see. I, and I always wonder what these people look like. So I look for pictures of, you know, old dudes that might, Simeon may have looked like, you know. Uh, but he, he comes to find Jesus, you know, and I just wonder how, how excited he possibly could have been. But I just think it's an amazing thing. This man always lived with the hope that God spoke to his heart and said, you're not going to die until the Christ comes. You're going to see the Christ come. And that's a, that's a pretty cool hope. You know, we hold out a hope too, don't we? That Jesus is coming back soon. And it's looking sooner and sooner all the time. We have the same hope. So you might have a face like one of those guys. It says in 1 John 3, 2 and 3, it says, Beloved, we are now the children of God and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. But we know that when he is revealed, that's Jesus, we shall be like him for we shall see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. I want you guys to meditate on that just for a minute. There is this hope about Christ coming at any moment that does something to you. It keeps you from doing stupid things you would otherwise do. And it keeps you alive for Jesus Christ. It keeps you witnessing to your neighbors. It keeps you from doing other things that are compromises because you're waiting for Jesus to come at any moment in time. And it says here, everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. You know, it has everything to do with what's on your mind and what you're thinking about. Are you looking forward to the Lord coming back? Or are you kind of saying, well, I hope he doesn't come back yet. I got this thing I got to straighten out. It says, by having this hope in him, it purifies us. It purifies us. That's a good thing to think about. And I don't know about you, but I could, I could use some extra purification in my mind. And when the parents brought the child Jesus to do to him according to the custom of the law, he, you remember this guy, I'm going to pick that face. He took up in his arms and blessed God and said, now, <laughs> they're going to the temple with the Messiah, baby boy. He was eight days old. He got circumcised. Now it's 40 days later. We're going to go make a sacrifice. And some old dude shows up. He's 113 years old. He's by himself. And walks up to you with the big wide eyes and says, give me a baby. <laughs> That's what it says. He walks up and takes the child. How, how free are you about giving up your kids to somebody? You know, I, we, have a, we have a little five-year-old granddaughter who just thinks she's Hercules, and she kind of is, but she wants to hold babies. Like, huh. her, her little brother, just, you know, a couple of years behind her, and he's, he's like a rock. She wants to hold him. You, you, you can't hold him. Oh, yeah, I can. I mean, I'm, I'm careful about that. I don't know about a newborn into a stranger's hands who I don't even know. Some 113-year-old guy just came off the street who could be looking like he's homeless. There you go. Can you imagine the trust? You really have to trust the Lord in that situation. He took him up in his arms and he blessed God and he said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace. You know what he's saying? Now I can die. The first lullaby Jesus got was, thank God I'm going to die. <laughs> That's what it says. I'm not making this up. You people think I'm funny. You're letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation. Interesting. What does Jesus' name mean? Jehovah is salvation. He didn't even know his name yet. Was, this guy's prophesying. According to your word, my eyes have seen your salvation. By the way, salvation is a person. It's not an idea. It's not a doctrine. It's a person. 
which you have prepared before the face of the peoples, a light to bring revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. So he sees into the future and he sees that Jesus is going to be the one who, when shared with the Gentiles, the Gentiles will respond and come to Jesus Christ. How many of you all are Gentiles? Isn't that nice? I think it's a good thing. And Joseph and his mother marveled at those things which were spoken to him. And Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, behold, this child is destined for the fall and rising of many in Israel and for a sign which will be spoken against. Yes, a sword shall pierce through your own soul also that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. You see, he knew Jesus came and he's going to bring separation, not unity. And he's going to disclose what's on people's hearts and what's in their mind. And people aren't going to like it. And it's going to break your heart. Can you imagine having some old strange guy grab your baby and start prophesying at you these things? And yet she must have known something. Remember when Jesus had to carry his own cross and we know that Mary went with him because Mary ends up at the cross. She's probably just shadowing him the entire time. And she had to watch him stumble and fall when he couldn't carry it. He had to watch him get beaten and rejected. And of course, she was there at the cross when none of the other disciples other than John had the bravery to go there. She was there. And he said, it's going to be a, like a sword piercing through your own soul as well. And what it's going to do is it's going to disclose the hearts of people that their hearts might be revealed. Remember when he was before Pilate and Pilate said, are you a king? And he goes, yeah, it is as you have said. But if my kingdom were of this earth, I'd, I'd call on my servants and they'd have me delivered. But my kingdom's not of this earth. You see? And he says, I don't find anything wrong with this guy. This is, this is the man that's going to put him to death. I don't see anything wrong with him. He says he's the king of heaven. I agree. He's no, he's no challenge to my authority. Even his enemies agreed. But you see, it revealed his heart because eventually he washed his hands in front of everybody and said, listen, I don't want any responsibility. You guys do whatever you want to do. Well, you know, when you make no decision, you make a decision. And when you reject Jesus Christ, it's the worst decision that you'll ever make in your life because it's final, it's eternal. I think about Jesus when they took out his body, which they had to watch him when the darkness fell in the middle of the afternoon and the earth quaked and rocks split and the temple curtain was torn in two from top to bottom and Jesus died and he breathed his last. She was there for all of that. This is what he's prophesying of that would happen. It's what we celebrated when we took communion this morning. We remembered all of what Jesus went through. And yet we know so much more now on this side than Mary knew when she was there, that he did it for us. Psalm 41.9 says, Even my own familiar friend in whom I trusted, who ate my bread, has lifted up his heel against me. A prophecy given hundreds of years before Jesus showed up that his own friend, who would be Judas Iscariot, would be the one. There's another one that talks about 30 pieces of silver, and that that 30 pieces of silver would then be thrown into the temple. It's exactly what happened when Jesus came. It's in Zechariah. Now there was one, Anna, a prophetess, the daughter of Phenuel of the tribe of Asher. She was a great age. Hey, how old are you? I'm of a great age. That's a gracious answer. And had lived with a husband seven years from her virginity, and this woman was a widow of about 84 years, who did not depart from the temple, but served God with fastings and prayers night and day. And coming in that instant, she gave thanks to the Lord and spoke of him to all those who looked for redemption in Israel. So when they had performed all things according to the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee, to their own city, Nazareth, 
And the child grew and became strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. So not only do you have an old man who takes this child, but you have an old woman who shows up. And she was only married for seven years, lost her husband, and stayed single, and now she's 84 years old. And all she does is pray and fast and speak to people about the Lord. What a great life that is. You know, if you've got to be single, that is the best occupation I can think of. And she chose to do that. And so I, I think of these two old folk rejoicing in this baby, and, and I think of Mary and Joseph kind of going, what the heck's going on here? I mean, some weird things have happened so far. Can you imagine all of that surrounding Jesus and his birth? Can you imagine not having the book of Luke that we can read and hear the story? Because you won't find it in the book of John. You won't find it in Matthew. You won't find it in Mark. I'm just so glad that God's given us four versions of the same exact story from four different points of view and that he used Luke to be able to write this gospel. So Anna is an example of serving and praying. She's always praying and serving, occupying herself with those things. I don't know about you, I read that and I think, I think I do a lot. Man, this is all she does. And she goes around and tells everybody. So she heard about this with, uh, with uh, Simeon there, and she's now going to tell everybody that she sees that the Messiah is born. I just think that's an amazing life. And she's always worshiping and always witnessing. You know, we need more people like Anna who are filled with the Spirit of God and who are just excited to be alive and excited about their relationship with God and to be able to tell people. I think it's fantastic. So, Luke chapter 2. Went through 40 whole verses here, boys and girls. We're flying. And there were all of the prophecies given about the birth of Jesus Christ that I was going to compile and put together, and you guys have probably heard them all before, so I've just kind of touched on them, but there are so many more. Feel free to get in the Bible, read on ahead. Uh, we're going to read about Jesus' adolescent life and, and how he was convicted of... Uh, he wasn't convicted of anything. If you've ever felt bad about losing your kids at the mall, be here next week. I'm going to ask the worship team to come up, and uh, we'll do one last song for you guys. Please. 